The following program may contain coarse language, violence, nudity, mature subject matter, or scenes which may not be suitable for all viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And good evening, one and all. This is the X Zone. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center and studios in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. If you would like to send me an email, xzone at xzoneradiotv.com on all social media sites. Exxon Radio TV, and we're coming to you tonight around the world on the Talk Star Radio Network, Mutual Broadcast Network, Exxon Broadcast Network, and on Channel 54 on Simul TV, which is the Exxon TV channel where we broadcast television shows, movies, documentaries, 724, 365. And to find out how you can subscribe to our uh, our channel at Simul TV, visit their website, www.simultv.com. My guest this hour is a gentleman I've had the pleasure of having on the show for many years. His name is Mark Anthony, and he is known as, well, he's a psychic. He studies what people do on the other side of life. He's a speaker. He's a medium. And he is going to be joining us right now to talk about the afterlife and King Tut and much more. Mark, great having you back, buddy. Rob, it is it is so great being back on the X Zone. I always love working with you, so thank you for having me on. It's an honor. Uh, the pleasure is all ours, my friend. Um, for the listeners and viewers who have not had the pleasure of hearing or seeing you before, tell them a little bit about yourself, Mark. My name is Mark Anthony, and my brand is Mark Anthony JD Psychic Explorer. Now, JD is my Juris Doctorate because I'm an attorney, so I'm also known as the Psychic Lawyer. Apparently, the News media loves to give me uh, nicknames, and so they call me the Psychic <laughs> Lawyer and the Psychic Explorer uh, because I'm a psychic medium, which means I communicate with spirits. And the thing is, this is an inherited trait that runs in my family. Both my parents had these abilities, runs for generations. Uh, I tracked it back into the 1890s on both my mother's and father's side of the family. Both my parents were mediums. Dad was a NASA engineer and a Navy SEAL. Mom was a commercial illustrator. So it's not like, you know, they were running around with Ouija boards and, you know, neon yeah. signs. I mean, you know, we were the quote unquote all American family next door. And um, when I was about three and a half, I started seeing spirits and mommy and daddy could see them as well. So I remember mom's reaction was, oh, he's got it. And dad's was like, oh, geez, he's got it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, heavens to us. So when did you start uh, doing the great work that you do now professionally, full time? I mean, do you still practice law? I, I left um, the, the active practice of law, although I appear on a number of shows, including the, you know, like this one as a legal analyst, but I also appear as a paranormal expert, near-death experience researcher, survival of consciousness uh, expert. I talk about ancient mysteries. We're going to talk some about yeah. uh, those tonight and, and certainly as a psychic medium. And uh, I, I left the active practice of law. It, it's an interesting story how that happened, Rob. Um, my mother had passed and actually it's going to be 16 years this week. She passed oh on October 5th of 2006. And you know, it was really a very difficult time in my life. And the day before she passed, I was at my law office. I was a senior partner in a law firm, and I was thinking about my mom, and I was thinking about spaghetti. You know, I'm of Italian descent, so I'm always thinking about spaghetti. And all of a sudden, the <laughs> phone rings. My secretary puts it through, and it's mom. And she goes, hey, honey, I made spaghetti for lunch. Do you want to oh. come over? You know, my parents didn't live that far from my office, so I went over. And, Rob, I had the most wonderful time talking and laughing with my mom and dad. And before we left, uh, I left. Mom hugged me and kissed me and said, I love you so much. I'm so happy that you're my son. And I said, I love you too, mom. 
that's the last thing I ever said to her. And that she said to me in, in this world. And the next day I was in court and the judge's assistant came into to the courtroom and said, Mark, we need you in chambers right now. And they handed me the phone and my office uh, said that uh, my dad had called and that my mother had passed. She, she died of a heart failure in, in her sleep. And even though I'm a medium and I can communicate with spirits and this has been part of my life, yeah. it doesn't bounce off me. Uh, grief hurts. Sure does. And about two, two weeks or so after that, I was driving back from court and also when those waves of grief hit and I thought, okay, I cannot go walking into my office um, crying and, and upset. And so I pulled over in this convenience store in the parking lot. I wanted to get my act together. And all of a sudden this flash of light goes off. And I look to the passenger side and I see the silhouette of my mother in this silver white light. And her voice fills my head. And I hear, you've been given the gift of mediumship so that you would not be crushed by grief. But now you must help those who are suffering with theirs. So I'm breaking out in a sweat because this is like, okay, I mean, I've, I've seen stuff my whole life, but this is sure. like. And then the next round of messages flooded through me. And mom said, your life's work is to help people understand that God exists that heaven exists, that your soul is an immortal living spirit, that humans can communicate with spirits and that you will be reunited, you meaning all of us, will be reunited with our loved ones in the light once you leave the material world. And I remember sitting there and, and going, okay. <laughs> I mean, it was, <laughs> it was so overwhelming. Wow. And within weeks, um, I started working on my first book. I was offered a job at a government agency to segue out of the practice of law. And less than a year later, my first book came out, Never Letting Go. Yeah. I've written Evidence of Eternity and now my new book, uh, The Afterlife Frequency, since then. And here's what's so uh, bizarre about how I left the practice of law. So my manager, I, I brought on a manager. She's still with me, Rocky. She books me in New York City and, and got me on a show on MSNBC. And then we, uh, she booked me in Boston to speak at Harvard. So here I am at Harvard, and it's, it's a couple of weeks before Christmas. And, and uh, you know, Boston's a beautiful city, and Harvard's campus is, is amazing. And... All of a sudden, I get this call from my, my boss, the elected official of the government agency I'm working at. And he said, I'm catching too much flack for having a psychic on staff. And I'm like, well, you know, and he said, and you're taking too much time off. I said, yeah, but this is all my vacation time. Well, uh, uh, I said, look, let me make this easy on you. I quit. <laughs> and, and, and he goes, okay. And I hung wow. up my phone, my cell phone, and then I look at Rocky and I go, oh, my God, I just quit the practice of law. And she said, Mark, look around. Where are you? I said, Harvard. And she said, and what are you doing in an hour? I said, signing copies of my new book after I give a lecture on life after death. And she said, don't you think this is where you're supposed to be? And so that's how I left the practice of law. Fascinating story. Um, tell me, why is it some people like yourself have the ability to communicate with the other side. And there are people like me who has tried, but you just can't do it. We Well, we all have the same physiological equipment because this isn't magic or hocus pocus. It's based on human physiology. And there's two receptor areas in the body. Mm -hmm. One is at the bottom of the rib cage. Uh, it's, it's the solar plexus. Right. OK, most complex bundle of nerves in the body outside of the cerebral cortex referred to as the second brain by a number of neurologists now. And, mm -hmm. you know, other species like an octopus has five brains. OK, I guess, to yeah. you know, <laughs> manage everything going on with them. And this is where we receive our gut feelings. And you're a guy and you get gut feelings and yeah. instinctual feelings. 
And guess what, Rob? That mm -hmm. is psychic ability, so you are doing it. The okay. second receptor area is behind the center of our forehead, um, which in yoga would be the indigo chakra, referred to as the third eye chakra. And roughly four or four and a half to five inches behind the forehead, inside of the brain, is the pineal gland. Yes. Pineal, yeah, the most mysterious gland in the body, studied immensely. Scientists are still just beginning to understand it. And for something that's between the size of a grain of rice and a lima bean, mm -hmm. it does a lot. It controls our brainwave frequencies, our circadian rhythms, the secretion of melatonin, our ability to perceive light. I mean, our reticular activating system. It does so many things. And within the pineal gland, recent studies have found magnetite and calcite crystals. Mm. Both of these, magnetite has an electromagnetic field. And what was the first radio? Quartz crystal, yep. mag magnetite and calcite, with low levels of electricity running through it. So we have something much more sophisticated in our head. And so when we receive auditory, visual, data, um, more precise information in conjunction with the emotional feelings, so we have two psychic receptor areas in our body. Now the question is, why are people like me able to voluntarily tune into spirits? In my book, The Afterlife Frequency, I go into this in great detail, but to give the, the shortened version, we have five different brain waves, frequencies, gamma, beta, alpha, theta, delta. And it's on the alpha, theta border where brainwave frequency ranges roughly between three and, and 15 hertz. And this is where psychic and mediumistic activity occur. And Rob, I'll bet you've had dreams where a loved one has come and communicated with you, right? Yes, yeah. And you felt that it was real, didn't you? Very much so. Well, then you've had a mediumistic experience. It's just that most people have it in the dream state because it takes several hours oh. to get to that frequency. And what we don't understand yet we meaning those of us who study this, mm -hmm. is why people like me can go from the beta state, the conscious state that we're in, to the alpha theta border within seconds and voluntarily. And it could be maybe I have an extra calcite crystal or magnetite right. crystal, or there could be something else with the neurons in the brain. So it's simply physiological. It's like, why can't everybody be an Olympic swimmer? Why can't everybody be a math genius like Stephen Hawking? It mm -hmm. comes down to we're all good at doing different things. Mark, you and I have to take our first break. Always great seeing you. And uh, I'm glad you're back on the road helping as many people as you can after this COVID fiasco we've all been under. Please stand by, my friend. The next donation, our guest is uh, medium Mark Anthony, JD Psychic Explorer, the psychic lawyer, a great guy. His website, are you ready for this? Do you have your pencils and paper ready? afterlifefrequency.com and mark and i will be back after this very short break don't go away well you can tell it's getting near halloween when my good friend and master control craig plays those creepy channel ids we have thanks a lot for that craig kind of look too real would you guys get that one all right next donation my guest this hour is medium mark anthony and uh he's uh Got a new book out called The Afterlife Frequency. Uh, Mark, first of all, thanks for joining us. Tell us a little bit about your new book because I'm, I'm totally interested in it. I have to go out and buy one now. Thanks. The Afterlife Frequency is different from other books written by mediums and other mm -hmm. books in the genre because I take a scientific approach to explaining spirit communication and the different forms of it. So traditionally... Uh, mediumship, in other words, communication with spirits through a medium, um, an after-death communication where spirits may come and visit somebody in a dream or you may feel them around, even if you're not a medium, near-death mm -hmm. experiences where people um, physically die and their consciousness leaves their body. In other words, they die, yet they live to tell about it and they return. Right. Share death experience and deathbed vision where somebody who's in the transition of dying and they see spirits and people in close proximity experience that. Traditionally, Rob, all these forms of spirit 
communication, which I call interdimensional communication, because it's communication between our material world dimension and the afterlife frequency, the other side. Traditionally, they've all been studied and put in separate categories, but they're not. There is a common denominator between all of them. And in the afterlife frequency, I introduce my theories based on science to explain all of this, including my signature theory, the electromagnetic soul. And uh, the EMS, a, lo- a number of scientists have already adopted the, the term, the EMS, the electromagnetic soul, because that's a 21st century term mm-hmm. to explain what we really are, which is pure consciousness. That is eternal electromagnetic energy. And so all of this is explained in great detail in the afterlife frequency. Also, I don't want the listeners thinking that this is some dry, boring treatise. It's not. Um, I, I Yes, I explain the science, but I, I illustrate everything with, with fast-moving stories um, to cover several different aspects of spirit communication. And uh, the thing is, Rob, I suffered through so many boring books in the practice of law and in law school. I made a solemn promise that I would never inflict that on anyone. So my books... Um, well, they're page turners and they will they will keep you engaged because it is is my obligation um, as an afterlife researcher and as a medium to help people understand that physical death is not the end of of existence. Yeah, you, know, you were talking about um, the different dimensions. Is it possible that we can also look at the different dimensions as different states of consciousness? And I'm going to tell you why I'm asking you this. Yeah. When I when I had my fall off the roof, and as I was waiting for help, something happened. There was a connection. It wasn't a near-death experience that I was having. If it was, it was a fully conscious one. Is that possible? Yes, it is. What we've now seen, traditionally, people think of a near-death experience of, as you die. Right. Okay? Your, your heart stops, you stop breathing, and your consciousness leaves. But what we're seeing now is that people who are still physically alive, Mm -hmm. their consciousness is still capable of leaving their body. And I have communicated with a number of electromagnetic souls of people Mm -hmm. whose bodies were still alive, Um, people that have been on life support, people who have had severe brain impairments like Alzheimer's were able to communicate with me. Um, I've been at bedsides of people who were essentially non-responsive, but they were in the transition between our world and the next, and they have been able to communicate with me. So what the experience you've described would be, if we had to categorize it, could be called an out-of-body experience, albeit an involuntary one. It's not like you were meditating and said, okay, I want to take my consciousness and protect it. It wasn't. But, it yeah. wasn't an out of body experience, Mark. Like I, I, I knew I was still in my body. I didn't see anything extraordinary, but it, it felt as if I wasn't alone. Someone or something sure. or or this group was with me. Yeah, you know, it it was very strange. Exactly. Um, welcome to what it's like to be me. And, oh my and God. so so you experienced that, and you said that you didn't feel alone. There was yeah. someone or several someone's yes. with you. One of the things we've seen, uh, certainly in mediumship and in near-death and shared death experiences, is the sense of interconnectedness, Uh that you felt connected to something greater than yourself, and you became aware of more than one consciousness, more than one electromagnetic soul. Mm -hmm. So, yes, you you had a a form of a near-death experience. And I say, you know, out of body experience yeah. only because what you're describing is also very typical of people that have an OBE. Mm-hmm. So even though it was it was a terrible accident, what a fascinating experience that that you had. You know, I learned two things uh, during that episode. Number one, Newton was right; gravity does exist. And number two, it's not the fall that kills or hurts; it's a sudden stop. Yes. 
Yes. You know, um, and, 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 <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I, I fell 15, 20 feet right onto the concrete and I'm down there and I'm trying to move and I think, oh, something is definitely wrong. Just stay still. And then I'm thinking of that stupid commercial on TV where the person has the button, help, I fall and I can't get up. And, you know, here I am laughing. I'm in pain. I'm laughing. And all I can think of is this commercial. Then this is when that, that experience that I can't, I could, I can't put a, a, a title on it, but all I know there is much more than we understand or we wish to believe that we're part of that changed in the blink of an eye. Absolutely. That's, that's incredible. Mm. And, and I think that in the 21st century, it's not that these experiences are happening more frequently. They're being reported more frequently because near death experiences and situations like you have described have been documented for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, scripture is filled with accounts of, of NDEs. I gave a presentation recently at the International Association for Near Death Studies about Jonah and the whale. You know, we all know the story of for the yep. prophet Jonah. He was supposed to go to what is now Iraq, and he said, no, I don't want to. And, he, you know, he disobeyed God, so he was on the ship, and then uh, the storms came, and the crew threw him overboard to appease God, and he gets swallowed by a whale or a fish. Uh, and then three days later, he spit up. And, you know, if, if people want to take Scripture literally, that is certainly their choice. But I am in the metaphorical. I look at Scripture as symbolic, and it appears that the Jonah and the whale mm -hmm. could very well be a metaphor for a near-death experience, because Jonah may have drowned, um, or, or, or he was um, injured, uh, maybe on a boat or washed up on the shore, and was in an inert state for three days, and then he came back. And when you read the scripture about how he went to the the basically the the root of the earth, and then ascended to the temple of the Lord. Yes. Wow, this is sounding very much like an NDE. And I could mm -hmm. go on and on with examples of that. But um, and it's funny too because I, I said, well, for our literal friends, can a whale swallow a human? And, and a whale's esophagus is only four and a half to five inches in diameter. But in June of 2022, this guy was a lobster diver, Michael, I think his name is Michael uh, Pritchard or, or Packard Pritchard, I think it was. And he was diving for lobsters off of Cape Cod. And all of a sudden he said he felt the shove and everything went black and he couldn't move. And at first he thought he had been eaten by a shark. And then he realized he was in something 30 seconds later, he gets spewed out. A humpback whale had actually engulfed oh my gosh. him. Yeah. And, and it spit him out, and he ended up in the hospital. Um, but see, in, in ancient times, when that happened, you ended up in Scripture. But in the 21st century, he ended up on the Jimmy Kimmel talk show on television and Unreal. being hailed as the modern-day Jonah. And so the thing is, humpback whales don't eat people. He just happened to get in the way of it feeding. And this whale's probably like, what is that in my mouth? And it spit yeah. him out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so for our literalist friends yeah. with scripture, theoretically, I don't think, you know, a whale would keep somebody in its mouth for yeah. three days, but certainly it can for 30 seconds. Mark, how do you go from um, the afterlife frequency to King Tut? Well, part of, of uh, what I do is mm -hmm. study ancient mysteries. I've spent my whole life um, studying archaeology and history, and the discovery of King Tut's tomb is very timely right now because so. it, is, it is the 100th anniversary of the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb. And it is such a fascinating story. Also, there supposedly is a curse. And, and supposedly, wasn't the sarcophagus also on the Titanic? I, I've heard rumors about that story as well. Yeah, that 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 would no, no. because okay. because that the Titanic went down in 1912. This no. was 10 years later. There uh, was an an archaeologist, Howard Carter, 
Mm-hmm. And, and I know we're coming up on a break, so just you yep. know, let me know. Sure. But, but Howard Carter did did not go to college. He did not have the credentials. He uh, was an Englishman and a confirmed bachelor, uh, genius, couldn't stand stupid people, couldn't stand questions from reporters. And when he was a teenager, he went to Egypt. He was a very gifted artist, and he used to draw the paintings and tombs, and he worked for archaeologists. Worked his way up through the ranks, learned how to read um, Egyptian hieroglyphs. Uh, you know, basically, he didn't need to go to to Oxford or Cambridge. He acquired the knowledge, and he kept seeing uh, the symbol of a King Tutankhamun. And that Tutankhamun's tomb had not been found. Very few records of him. He was convinced that he could find Tutankhamun, and he met the fifth Earl of Carnarvon, who was a British aristocrat who was uh, visiting Egypt because he had health. I think he had uh, um, some lung issues. So he used to like to spend the winters in Egypt. And and what's interesting about Lord Carnarvon, uh, Rob, is his great-grandson, the eighth Earl of Carnarvon, is still in residence at High Clare Castle. Here's the best part. Every, I bet pretty much all of your viewers are familiar with High Clare Castle because that's where Downton Abbey is filmed. And the Carnarvon family still lives there. And all the scenes with the aristocrats are filmed upstairs but the scenes with the servants, which supposedly take uh, place in the basement, mm-hmm. they won't allow cameras down there because it is rumored the Carnarvon family's private Egyptian collection is in the basement. So, warping back in time to 1922, Lord Carnarvon agrees to finance Howard Carter. It's going on year after year. It's like 10 years into it. World War I comes and goes. They can't do the excavations. But now World War I's over. Carnarvon's running short on cash. Yes. And he tells Carter, I'm cutting funding. And Carter begs one more season. So Carter's abrupt and rude. Okay. And everybody that worked around him knew that, you know, don't get in his way. But this was a big expedition. It employed 100 laborers. And he'd rented a house a couple miles away from the excavation. And he bought this canary out of bazaars in this golden cage. And he had this little canary. And his staff could see, the, the staff of his servants at home, you know, he's acting like a British aristocrat. He's got all his staff. And, <laughs> and yeah, and the canary would sing and it would calm him down. And, and, this, you know, there, and, and the canary became the mascot of the expedition. In fact, they called it the expedition of the golden bird. And Carter lurches awake on November 4th, 1922. And the, the bird singing sweetly to him. And he goes out to the excavation and nothing's happening. And he's like, what? What's going on here? And the foreman runs up to him and they said, we found something. They bring him to a site, which is right near the tomb of Ramses VI. And they've been working around Ramses VI tomb for 10 years. And this one area, they found a step in the sand. And so Carter's like, okay, okay. And they get the the team working on it. They found another step, 16 steps going down into the earth. All right. We're going to have to have a bit of a cliffhanger when we come back. 16 stairs going down to the earth. Mark Anthony is my very special guest. His uh, website is afterlightfrequency.com. We'll be back after we can, after we have these few words, getting back to Egypt, 16 steps down. Toot and calm. Here we come. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. Whatever you do, don't don't go away because um, what's that, Craig? Well, Craig is saying that we're going to skip this break because he's so interested in what we're talking about. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. Let's go so, down 16 stairs. 16 stairs. Carter is thinking, well, maybe it's going to be another empty tomb. You see, Tutankhamun was not in a pyramid. And people think you got to realize that the pyramids were built 2500 B.C. Tutankhamun was buried 
1300 BC, almost as much time passed between the construction of the Great Pyramid and the burial of Tutankhamun than between the birth of Jesus and the discovery of the New World by Christopher Columbus. That's a long period of time. And Cleopatra didn't show up for another 1300 years after Tutankhamun. So we're talking, this is a really, really ancient land. And Tutankhamun was buried in an area of, which is near modern-day Cairo um, that they call the Valley of the Kings, because in the later phase of Egyptian history, the kings were buried underground. Mm -hmm. So he's thinking, well, this is great. Um, we're not sure what it is yet, and it's probably another empty tomb. And then 16 steps down, they find a door. So the, the um, workers clear mm -hmm. the sand away from the door, Carter's heart almost stops, Rob, because when he looks at the door, there's a clay seal on the door that has not been broken, and, he, and it has the symbol Tutankhamun. Carter is like, oh, my God, we have found a tomb that has not been opened. He immediately gets guards, puts them all over the place. He's got to get back. Um, to notify Lord Carnarvon. Meanwhile, at his house, a few miles away, at the precise time the tomb was discovered, the Egyptian staff members at Carter's house hear the shriek, and they run into uh, his living room, and a cobra had gotten into the cage with the canary and was devouring his canary. And the Egyptians were horrified because they knew that cobras were the symbol of the pharaohs. And immediately they felt this was an evil omen that the expedition had, the, the mascot of the expedition had been devoured by a cobra. <clears throat> well, this started circulating. Meanwhile, Lord Carnarvon and his daughter, Lady Evelyn, and it's interesting because it looks like um, in Downton Abbey, Lady Mary was was based on Lady Evelyn. Right. You start looking at, at all that. It takes him three weeks to get from England to Egypt. You know, this is 1922, mm -hmm. and, and he can't just run off and leave his castle and the 100 servants working there. So it's November 26th, 1922. So they're back at the, the, the door. They take apart the seal that says Tutankhamun. They open the door. And there's a hallway, and it's filled with all types of debris. Took an entire day to clear this 30-foot hallway. And then they come to another door, which is also sealed. And I want to read from Carter's own, own book what he said about this. He said, um, okay, it's November 26, 1922. An excited Lord Carnarvon and Lady Evelyn stood with Howard Carter at the entrance of the tomb. So Carter drills a hole in the upper left-hand corner of this, this ancient wooden door. And all of a sudden, warm air comes out, and it smelled like perf lightly like perfume and coconut oil. And they were mystified. Mm. And Carter said, you know, nobody had breathed this air in 33 centuries. So in his own words, Carter described what happened next. For the moment... An eternity it must have seemed to the others standing by. I was struck dumb with amazement. And when Lord Carnarvon, unable to stand the suspense any longer, inquired anxiously, Can you see anything? It was all I could do to get out the words, Yes, wonderful things. Carter had been holding a candle, mm -hmm. and he said everywhere he looked was the glimmer of of gold. And so then Lady Evelyn and Lord Carnarvon, and eventually they opened up the doors and they were overcome with what they saw. They saw chariots, a throne, linens, board games, all types of clothing, um, all piled on top of each other. And there were several rooms. I think there was like five rooms but it took 10 years to get everything out of the tomb. 
Carter brought. He immediately assembled the best of the best. He got the best uh, photographer from the Met in New York City. He pulled in experts from the British Museum, from the Louvre, uh, from all over, uh, even got some German archaeologists there, even though they just concluded a war. The Germans, you know, were great archaeologists and they were very meticulous in labeling everything. They found over 5,000 objects. And when they finally got to the king's sarcophagus, it had this huge granite, um, uh, you know, lid. Yes. And they got they got that off, and it had been cracked. It was cracked, you know, after thousands of years. Sure. And there was a wooden coffin in there, and they were trying to lift it out, and they couldn't understand why it was so heavy. So very carefully, they developed a series of winches and, and lifts, and they found that it was the first of three coffins. They're arthropoid. In other words, they look like uh, humans. Mm -hmm. um, and all of them were, were, were gilded with gold. But the innermost coffin was solid gold, 250 pounds of gold. Then they realized why it was so heavy. And then when they opened that, they couldn't believe what they saw because the king's mummy had the famous golden death mask yes. over that. So they had, in, in, in today's dollars, the weight of gold would be worth almost $6 million dollars. But being what it is, it's, it's essentially priceless. But right after this, within a few years, over two dozen people associated with the tomb. Well, let me back up a bit. Okay. This was the biggest story in the world. Every news outlet was there. Carter hated the reporters couldn't stand their questions. He had no patience for this. Lord Carnarvon, on the other hand, he was an attention sponge. He loved it. <laughs> yeah, he liked talking to him and all that. But then he thought he'd make some money off of it. And why right. shouldn't he? I mean, he'd invested, you know, tremendous amounts of money. Yep. He, But he sold the exclusive rights of the story of the tomb's excavation to the London Times. So we cut out all the other media outlets, and they were furious. All right. Now my producer says we have to take this break, so please stand by. Exonation, our guest is Mark Anthony. His website is afterlightfrequency.com. We'll be back talking more about King Tut. Gone go away. And welcome back, one and all. This is the Exxon. I'm Rob McConnell. My very special guest this hour is Mark Anthony. Uh, his website is afterlightfrequency.com. We're talking about Mark's new book. The afterlife frequency, and we're also talking about King Tut, and this is one of the. Yeah, this is a great story. The fat, the best part is, it's real. It's not fiction, Mark. It it, it really is, yeah. and and so so Lord Carnarvon goes ahead and sells the rights to the excavation mm -hmm. exclusively to the London Times. So he effectively alienates every media outlet in the world. Well, the reporters are hungry for stories, and then they start hearing about the cobra that ate the canary, the mascot of the tomb. And then a reporter wrote a story that one of the artifacts found in the tomb was a clay tablet that said, death will slay with his wings, whoever disturbs the sleep of the pharaoh. So this starts kind of churning that there's mm. evil omens. But the shocker comes in April 1923. So it's only been, you know, five months or so since they've opened up the tomb. Lord Carnarvon drops dead in a Cairo hotel. Boom. And That's it. Drops yeah, dead. Yeah. Here's the benefactor. And he'd had an infection on his face from a mosquito bite. And, and then it is was reported that when he died, all the lights in Cairo flickered and went out for a moment. So now there's like, ooh, you know, mysterious forces <laughs> are at work. Yeah. But then, but then it didn't stop. More people started dying. And, and within a few years, uh, over two dozen people associated with opening the tomb or visiting it. In fact, American tycoon George J. Gould, British industrialist Joe Wolfe, British aristocrats Mervyn Herbert and Richard Bethel all died right after entering the tomb. And, and Lord Bethel's father, Lord Westbury, 
said, I can't take these horrors anymore. And he jumped out of a window in England to his death. And then at his funeral, uh, the funeral carriage ran over and killed an eight-year-old boy. So people are dying and rumors of Tut's curse are flying, Rob. I mean, the, now the media had their stories. And so they kept saying that uh, the, the mummy cursed every uh, everybody. And, and then uh, even Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, yeah. and I know he's been mentioned on this show a lot. He was also a medium, paranormal yes. expert. He had been friends with Harry Houdini for a while. He um, came... Uh, he opined of the opinion that the priests of ancient Egypt conjured elementals, evil spirits, to protect the tomb. But then there was other rumors that the ancient Egyptians used, they coated everything with poison or, or very toxic microbes. And there was even one theory that the Egyptians had put uranium all over everything. But the thing is, none of those have been substantiated. And you would think that the evil spirits and the curse, there'd be one person that they really would have it out for, and that would be Howard Carter. Right. But he died peacefully in England in 1939. But he was asked about, about the curse. And when interviewed about the curse of King Tut, Carter replied, and these are his words, Tommy Rot. The sentiment of the Egyptologist is not one of fear, but of respect and awe, entirely opposed to foolish superstitions. Hmm. But was he free of the curse? The one thing Carter couldn't stand was being probed, being in the spotlight, and for the rest of his life, he was always um, followed by paparazzi, and then, even though he was the most famous archaeology in the world, maybe archaeologist in the world, maybe one of the most famous of all times, he was snubbed by British academia since he didn't have a, a university degree. And so maybe the curse affected him through this constant uh, attention that he absolutely loathed. So, but the thing is, Rob, more questions arose. A very disturbing discovery was made in the tomb. Two mummified fetuses that appeared to be twin sisters. And D recent DNA analysis indicates that most likely Tutankhamun was the father. Now, why were they in there? Were they his miscarried children? Was this some bizarre ritual that we don't know about? Then there's the fate of his family. Tutankhamun, upon examination of the body, this was a very sick young man. He was only 19 years old when he died. It appears that he became king when he was nine. I could spend the next couple hours talking about what, what led up to all this. Right. But the thing is, right after he died, Within a year or two, his entire family vanishes. And his widow, who apparently was his half-sister, Anka Sanaman, also a teenager, she wrote to the king of the Hittites. Now, the Hittites live in what is now modern Turkey. And the reason we know that she wrote to him is uh, decades ago, their capital city, Hattusis, was excavated in what is now Turkey, and they found the royal archives with two letters from Tutankhamun's widow. And she said, I have no son. I mean, excuse me. I ha uh, my husband is dead, and I have no son, and I will not be forced to marry a servant. Send me one of your sons that he will become king of Egypt. King of the Hittites is like, yeah, I don't know about this, and says, Basically, I'm not so sure. She sends him another letter reiterating this. We do know that the king of the Hittites sent one of his sons. So we figure, all right, here's a, a royal prince, king of the Hittites, on his way to Egypt, mm -hmm. never makes it. And not only does he not make it, but right after that, it touched off a war that lasted 20 years between Egypt and the Hittites. 
the speculation is that son was ambushed and murdered because right after that, Anka Sanaman, a teenager, is married to the Grand Vizier, which would be like the prime minister, a man old enough to be her grandfather, a servant, and he becomes Pharaoh. And then she disappears from history. Even in, in Pharaoh I's tomb, it mentions his other wives, but not one trace of Anka Sanaman. Her mummy's never been found. No tomb associated with her has ever been found. And why is that? Mark, isn't there a, 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 a glyph or a, or a, uh, a statue or, or a painting or something that shows King Akhenaten with his wife and on her lap are, are two children? Correct. And Akhenaten was Tutankhamun's father. That's why I said I could spend hours about yeah. this. And Tutankhamun's father, Akhenaten, he ascended the throne as Amenhotep the um, the fourth, um, but changed his name to Akhenaten, which meant the joy of the sun. Right. And he converted Egypt into a monotheistic, in other words, a country to believe in one god, which was a particular aspect of the sun. And in the so Ra, doing, right? right. Well, yeah. it was Aton, which is an aspect of Ra. I see. But, but. He was the sole arbiter and communicator with this God. It was a very personal God. Oh, you mean like Jesus was with God and Christianity. Exactly. Yeah. And in doing that, he cut off all the funding to all of the temples throughout ancient Egypt. So with the with a so let it be written, so let it be done order, mm -hmm. he basically eviscerated the treasury of, of the religious hierarchy. So let me tell you, there was a lot of people, um, the high priests, um, all the temples of Egypt, they wanted Akhenaten gone, but he ruled for roughly 20 years, 19 years, they believe. And his, his mummy apparently has been found, um, has been found. Um, but then when he dies, his nine-year-old son, but there appears to have been a, possibly another pharaoh in between. And we're not sure if it was a queen or another son, Smenkare. And Smenkare is a very shadowy, transitory figure. But then Tutankhamun, a nine-year-old boy, orders the restoration of the ancient religion. Yeah, right. Like a nine-year-old is going to understand that. Also, um, it appears that this nine-year-old had a club foot. He had uh, clipophile syndrome. Um, he had Sickle cell anemia, suffered from malaria. This was a very, very sick boy. Oh my gosh. A sick young man. And there is speculation that he may have been murdered because his body was really badly mangled and his mummy did not contain the heart. Because Egyptians always took out the heart. Mm -hmm. They would dry it out, wrap it up, put it back in the body because the heart was essential in their belief to resurrection. The Egyptians didn't believe in reincarnation. They believed that the body would reanimate. I don't know how they expected that. You know, they wrap it up, pour all this goop on it, basically <laughs> glue it into a coffin, put it under tons of granite and underground, yeah. but somehow it's going to come alive, you know. But uh, but that was their belief system. And it, it appears that there were forces at work to completely eradicate that entire dynasty of Akhenaten so that the ancient religion could be restored. Uh, so there's and there's lots of mysteries and and uh, that, that are still confounding us. So Tutankhamun may have been, in the bigger scheme of things, a relatively insignificant king. And here's another thing. His tomb was the smallest in the Valley of the Kings, and archaeologists say that when you look at a tomb like that of Ramses the Great or Amenhotep the Third, Akhenaten's father, there would have been more treasure in one hallway of one of those tombs than in the entire tomb of Tutankhamun. Unreal. Hey, Mark, guess what time it is, buddy? It's about that time. It is. Mark, quickly, let our listeners know where they can find a copy of your book. Tell them about if I'm sure you're always traveling. So if there's any place where we can uh, tell our listeners you're going to be appearing and uh, your website. Yeah, I invite everyone to visit my website, afterlifefrequency.com, just like my new book, The Afterlife Frequency. 
Um, October 6th through 9th, I will be one of the keynote speakers at the Edgar Casey Ancient Mysteries Conference in Virginia Beach. And you can also um, get a ticket to see that online as well. I'm one of several speakers. We got great speakers going to be there. You can order copies of my books um, through the website. Uh, they're also available at all fine bookstores and on amazon.com. You can sign up for a reading with me and I invite everyone to please sign up for my newsletter to, so you can be kept up to date on uh, upcoming events. Rob, I wanna thank you and I wanna thank all the listeners of the X Zone uh, for having me uh, back on the show. I always enjoy this and I look forward to next time. Mark, as you well know, you're always welcome here, and I consider you a friend after all the years we've been together. And just keep up the great work, because I know that every time you talk, every time you're somewhere, you touch millions of people. So for those who don't have the opportunity that I have right now, thank you from all of those who can't say thanks, Mark, in person. Take care of yourself, my dear friend. Safe travels. Thank you. Many Good blessings. Mark. All right, Exo Nation, my guest this hour has been Mark Anthony. What a great guy. Um, like I said, I've had the pleasure of knowing him for a number of years, and I do consider him a friend. This is a short uh, edition of the Exo, and we have network priorities that are going to be taking over right now as we head back to Master Control. I'll be back tomorrow night at 10 o'clock as once again we cross the time space continuum to this place that I call the Exo. It's a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And um, like I said, we'll be back tomorrow night. So until then, I'd like to thank my producer here in the studio, Craig West, my program director, Mac Alexander, and of course, my senior executive producer and wife, Laura Rogers. Thank you very much for everything you do, Fang Gang. Fang Gang, there's a new word. And until tomorrow night, always remember to keep your eyes to the sky and your heart to the light. Good night, everyone. <laughs>